Okay, we are back. And I want to begin by doing just some quick housekeeping. If everyone could please tell me their burdens, the amount of gold or gold exchangeable treasures they have, and then their hunt roll tokens at present. I'm going to start with Ezio. I have two burdens as it stands right now and and four things I can exchange for gold. So I have a chain shirt, which I'm probably going to put on if we fight Malfast, which we probably will. A belcher gland, a handelier, <laughs> and and tentacles. And I have one hunt roll token. Was there something else? Did I forget? No, that's it. Uh, Saray, what do you have right now? I have three burdens. I uh, only have two gold. And I have one hunt roll token. My found equipment, all I have on here, and I don't know if it's worth anything, is Lord Galdron's Ledger. Oh, to the right buyer, that is worth a gold. Yeah. And Thessal. I'm sitting on four gold, uh, which includes some... I think I have the tentacles and the bile glands and, oh yeah, the, the eyes and chitinous scale from, from the ill belcher. And then I also have very fine farm tools, which I can also sell, which sets me up good because I have just three burden. Nice. Awesome. So with all that said, a quick recap. Last session, you made your way to the farmhouse. We basically had a session in the farmhouse. That's where most of it took place. And that was a a very horror focused thing <laughs> you learned that a woman named beatrix mandrake had sort of made this house her last stand or her defensible point at some point and she created this scarecrow guardian to help her control what was going on in the village of hester's mill you still don't have the full story there but you've kind of got big pieces of it you learned how to make the scarecrow yourself the Scarecrow Guardian that is there guarding the house, you interacted with it in a few different ways. And yeah, it was a good, like, kind of scary session. We learned a lot about the characters. You made your way to the village and began searching the village, encountered these hideous creatures, which we are calling... Cropopods. <laughs> yes. And ultimately, you ran into Beatrix Mandrake herself. You don't know where she came from, but she appeared... And she sort of gave you the tools you would need to see the true evil in Hester's Mill, which turns out to be this demonic crow thing surrounded by a bunch of little crows all inside of a nest made of oily black tentacles. And that was where we ended last time. And so I will just kind of zoom in again. On top of the mill, you do see this giant crow creature. I described last time that it regurgitated a soldier, and that soldier was devoured by the smaller crows. After the shock of seeing this, you begin to realize that it's on a loop. The central crow opens its mouth. You hear the screaming of the soldier. Help me! Help me! He comes out... He gets vomited out, he's half-dissolved, he looks exactly the same, and gets torn apart again by the smaller crows. And it does it again. And it doesn't seem to be particularly aware of you at this point. I'm going to pick up with Thessel. Thessel, what do you do? If I remember right, I was the one who was explicitly looking at the rooftop when we were spending our tokens. And so I probably see it first and, taken aback, just fall backwards, kind of panicking. Um, do you see that? Uh, and scoot backwards in the dirt. This is a, a horrifying thing to suddenly see, regardless of if it's noticing us or not. Ezio was looking at the autograph he got from Beatrix, which he had been holding up to the light to see the invisible writing that she had put into it. See what? The, the, the writing? And he, and he pulls down the autograph a little bit. The, ah! And he runs literally behind Thessel and like, what is that thing? I don't know. Don't ask me. An unholy abomination, it looks like. Uh, what? What are you... Th of course. What What are we going to do about that? Must we do anything about it? Ezio has begun digging through his pack and, like, perfume wafts out over the air as he as he pulls the, the chain shirt that I picked up earlier over his head. I, I don't know. Is that's what This is what happens, right? We fight the thing. We get to the thing. We fight the thing. No! Are we supposed to fight it? No! Why would we fight it? What are you talking about? Let's get out of here! Clutching his stiletto to his chest. Ah, okay, let's go. Well, so I guess the question is, where do you go? 
do we run back up the road or do we run toward the gallows? What do you guys think? Do we have to run past the mill to run to the gallows? You have to run past the mill to get to the road out of Hester's mill, because that's like the closest thing to the road, which makes sense, right? Because it's the yeah. mill. Gallows it is, it sounds like. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Ezio goes blind, streaking toward the gallows. They're not far away. Probably about a quarter of a mile, maybe. Lord Galdron's gallows were built high on a hill so that the people of Hester's Mill would have a good view of their friends and families swinging in the sun. As you approach, you'll notice that there's the gallows itself, you know, with a trap door and a sort of aproned area below where the body would fall. And then at the bottom of the hill, the first thing you encounter are a series of, uh, a trio, in fact, of oubliettes, which are pit-like cages that are built into the ground. And these pit-like cages have sort of slightly domed iron lattice cage doors on the ground, right? So they would lift these up and then just throw the prisoners in. And the prisoners couldn't escape because the bottom of the pit is like maybe 15 feet or so. And the walls balloon out beyond the opening of the pit so you wouldn't be able to climb up. One of the oubliette doors has a skeleton desperately clinging to the cage door from underneath as if the person managed to climb that far and then something killed them and they just never fell oh. <laughs> at another point you see some sort of like tribute perhaps near the base of the actual gallows platform a rib cage displayed as a sort of grisly cornucopia stuffed with skulls and dried corn and rotting gourds. You'll notice that there's still a piece of rope dangling from the gallows, and it is frayed and stained red. Saray, what do you do? Oh, and also the set goal. The set goal is to find the treasures of Hester's mill. It would seem even in death, their work is never done. And I'm looking down at this cornucopia, that even <laughs> their bodies are used to help firm up the roots of these things as I pull like a head of corn out of the center of the rib cage. This truly is a cursed place. And I wonder if it was something that came to the town or if it was more truly the town that brought it upon itself. I think I'm going to take this rib cage and overturn it. You can do that. That's easy enough. Yeah. Are you doing it just to sort of like strike this sort of blasphemous artifact or are you trying to accomplish something else? No, I think I am just trying to undo some of this land's blight. Yeah. Yeah. A little blasphemous, a little trying to understand maybe the sisterliness of this religion and my own. Yeah, that's good. Um, Ezio, what are you doing? Ezio has since reaching what he perceived to be a safe distance from the mill, has been walking backwards, watching the perverse display of of Malfast regurgitating the soldier, the soldier being consumed by crows, and then it resetting. Horrified. Ah, whatever is happening here, oh my, it must be in the soil, it must be in, in the area, in the air, here, right? These things don't happen just anywhere gesturing toward Malfast, still clutching my stiletto to my chest, the chain shirt I'm wearing now rattling loosely on my body. I've, I've never seen anything like this. I've only read about this. I was warned of things like this, but... <sighs> Ezio turns around and wanders toward one of the oubliettes, specifically the one with the, the skeleton clinging to the roof, and begins picking at its fingers to see how... If it's, if, is it being held on there naturally? Yes, it looks like they died clinging to the, and their arms sort of interlaced with the iron lattice. I can't say that they gave it up easily, though. At this point, you hear a voice, a voice that you recognize. It's the voice of the hunter who you believed was tied up, and maybe he was for a time. He says, I believe you all have something that belongs to me, and he comes from the other side of the hill to meet you all. I think since I'm the only one who hasn't really like started touching bones, what are you guys doing? I'm going to focus on him and I I kind of just lower my scythe at him. Not a step further! He puts his hands up 
and says, I mean you no harm, though I would certainly be within my rights to do you harm. And he sort of like rubs the back of his head <laughs> as he says that. But, and he looks over your shoulder to Saray, I did warn you that you should probably leave this place. There was nothing good here. And, as you can see, there is nothing good here. And he kind of looks in the direction of the demon, who he can clearly see as well. Perhaps if you could be more specific in your warnings, we would have listened. Well, I'm, <clears throat> I didn't quite know what I was looking for, to be perfectly honest. But it looks like you've managed to uncover it. And, my God, what a sight it is. I believe that there is a way to be rid of this thing. I believe that the secret to being rid of this thing is inside the mill. I am going to go there to try to learn the truth of it so that I can cleanse this land. Well, good luck. So long. Farewell. You don't care to join me in my heroic effort? You're just here robbing graves, hmm? I look at my companions. Yep, heroes die. <laughs> well, then, for all of our sakes, I hope that I, and I alone, am up to the task. I would like to have my bandolier back, though, if you don't mind. How would you think you are up to the task if you were so easily clubbed in the back of the head? And what bandolier? <laughs> he says, <clears throat> well... I will confess that I underestimated you, madam, and that is something that I will not do again. Tell me, what is your estimation of that giant monstrosity? For I fear you have shown us that you can underestimate someone such as myself. What estimation can you make of something extra human <laughs> such as that? It doesn't really matter what I think of it, because I do not intend to engage it. I managed to find my quarry, the sorceress Beatrix Mandrake, and she confided in me that the secret to dispelling or otherwise banishing this monstrosity is inside the mill, though she would not speak it aloud. She is something of a cagey individual. Where is she now? <laughs> I do not know, and I do not care. You don't care. I do not care. I got what I needed from her. She's the reason all this business is the way it is anyway. Frankly, I think I have nothing else to say on the matter. So you are only here to purify these lands. That is your goal, not money, fame. I am here to purify these lands because they are my lands. How so? <laughs> Let's just say, a very long time ago, I used to have dominion over this place before it was blighted. Are you going to give me what belongs to me, or not? Why are you looking at me? And with that, he just sort of, like, shrugs his shoulders and proceeds down the way toward Hester's mill, and he says, I have a feeling, wherever you're returning to, you're not going to make it, and I'll be able to retrieve what's mine at that time. Did he just claim to be Lord Galdrin? I know of no one else who ruled these lands. Well, he said he had dominion, whatever that means. Could be speaking in metaphors, or what have you. You know what these mysterious types do. Well, I hope he's successful. We can leave him to it. Yes, perhaps he will rid the land of this blight, and then we can see if there's anything shiny left afterwards. Ezio is, begins, like, kicking around the oubliette again, sort of around the skeleton. I don't know why I wanted to say skeleton. Around the skeleton. Are you uh, looking for something in particular? Or are you asking questions about the world? I will be in a moment. So Ezio, Ezio sticks his head down into the into the oubliette. There's, there's like grating here, right? Right. So I can, yeah. Yeah. And you can kind of hear his voice echo around the down into the the pit. What bandolier do you think he was talking about, anyway? Stop being so <laughs> daft, Ezio. All right, fine. <laughs> and I, I I dig around in my pack and like hold up the bandolier and like oh, okay, you got me. <laughs> and then I, I grab one of my candles, and I, I'm, I'm peeking down into the oubliette. I've never been in a jail like this. Seems kind of hard to get out of. I think that was the point. Huh. Go ahead and take a hunt roll, and since you're using your candles, you can roll two light dice. Oh, nice. Okay, so that's a four. You get a token, but you encounter something terrible. Take your token. 
you're looking down inside the oubliette, and I will tell you that these are not just holes dug in the ground. They're actually masoned spaces. There are stone walls and floor. That's something you'll notice. And the terrible thing you'll notice is that there are quite a lot more skeletons down in the oubliette. If the oubliette was strictly used by Lord Galdron and his forces, Lord Galdron was perhaps not just a heretic. He was clearly very cruel because there were many people killed. Uh, uh, Thessel, Thessel, come here. What? What? Look at this. Look at what? Look at all these people down here. It's a prison, a dungeon. What do you expect? Have you never been in a prison? This isn't... No, I haven't. What do you... What? Fine. Uh, there, you wouldn't keep this many... You would clean it up. This is awful. Why? Why? It looks like they were put there to die. That's the awful part. What are you not following? The gallows is for killing. This is for... Holden. Perhaps they threw the bodies in the pit. After they had hanged them. An extra bit of psychological torture to those who are already... Uh, awaiting death, perhaps? Giving them an improper burial? It's another way to enforce your sense of law? So Ray, would that be in line with his sort of religious views? Typically, we would want to burn the bodies. And I think I've made my way up on top of the, the gallows themselves. And I'm looking at the blood-stained rope and the trap door. Because I think I'm curious as well if they don't just, like loosen them up and drop them down in there or what's going on below this gallows area yeah take a hunt roll last time i didn't use anything this did not work out well for me but also i don't have anything worth using so no i'm not <laughs> using anything i will allow the dice to tell my story for me ah a four go ahead and take a token you hear something scratching beneath your boots basically something beneath the gallows there's like a space underneath there, which is currently covered by a wooden apron. And you can hear it clawing and scratching from underneath. What do you do? Thessel, do you hear that? And I think I take my club and bang in the general direction of the skittering underneath me as if to, to scare it. Thinking it's like some kind of an animal to like make it skitter away from the opening in the trap door. What? Hear your banging? Of course. Just... Please come up here. And I just bang again against the wood. <sighs> when you bang, it actually sort of scrambles toward the sound and presses its face up against the very, very thin gap where the wooden boards are laid next to each other. And you see just a sickly yellow eye staring at you from that gap and a sort of... <sighs> and a clicking sound in the throat. Thessel, there is something beneath the floorboards. I'm going to make my way up to stand next to Saray and I guess also like look down that crack and I assume I see the same eye and hear the same clicking. You do. If I remember right, the clicking is a thing that the ill belchers do. It, it is. It's definitely an ill belcher down there. You might even have, like, gag reflex if you've ever consumed any of their bile. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just want to know how it tastes. <laughs> That's one of those things. Those belchers. Leave it alone. Come on. There's no reason to open this up anyway. I might even take my scythe and I just, like, scrape it along that crack to try and get it away. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. And that will cause it to sort of like drop down. It seems like it was clinging to the underside. It'll sort of drop down and kind of give you a hiss. I hiss back. I'm like, yourself. <laughs> See, nothing to worry about. Come on. And I go back to one of the uh, oubliettes, uh, one of the ones that Ezio is not looking at. Can we open these these chambers? I guess I should look inside first. Yeah, if you want to like just peer down in, in one of them, you certainly can. It's a little dark. Do you have something to... Ezio, bring your light over here. Yeah, go ahead and roll a two light dice hunt roll. Uh, five. Nice. Go ahead and take a token. You're looking down inside, and you will see three more sets of those glowing yellow eyes staring back at you. 
from inside that oubliette. Which, by the way, does not have all the bones like the other one does. I quickly pull away from it. All right, not that one. Let's go look at the other one. (laughs) (laughs) Indeed, indeed. Why, what was down there? Uh, more belchers, I think. Ezio begins dabbing at his forehead. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the, the third one, the third one. I'll remind you all that you do have a fair number of tokens now. I, I mean, I think we, I think we even know it's just <laughs> in character. We don't want to fight. This. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we're, we'll, uh, yeah. That's what the tokens are for. Yeah, and that is a good point. Like the tension is there, but the narrative is a little stalled. I say we spend some tokens. Let's do it. I, I like that as well. That works. I mean, I've got, I've got four. I can just spend all three. As you look at the third oubliette, I've mentioned that they were mason stones. They match pretty well. You know, they're all like about the same color of slate gray. They all seem well masoned and well fitted. But in the third oubliette, you'll notice that one of the stones looks a little different. And it looks a little loose compared to the other ones as well. The oubliette is open. You can certainly swing it open and go down there and investigate if you wish. There's uh, there's no belchers down there. <laughs> At a glance, no. Hmm. There's something hidden behind that rock. What? What rock? Ezio, like, adjusts your glasses and pulls you in closer. That's rock right there. They all look the same to me. What are you talking about? I know a false wall when I see one. (laughs) Well, fine, but that means one of us has to go down there. And I'm gonna haul open the covering cage. And it's not going to be me. I'm gonna reach in my pack and grab my rope out. Saray, I'm suddenly overcome with with a faintness. Uh... (laughs) <laughs> Give me the damn rope. And I, I grab onto it with my hand and start trudging down. It's not too far down. Um, I mean, as long as someone holds one end of the rope, you can kind of lower yourself just enough to, to sort of hop down the rest of the way. Which rock did you say it was? Right there, the one that's a different color. Can you not tell? Is it on my left or my right? Your left. My left? There's only one. We're facing the... Warmer. <laughs> <laughs> I begin trudging down. There? Is it over here? Yes, you're right in front of it. Oh, wonderful. And I, you, you like see me just kind of like step lightly down off of the rope and then just extend my arm to try and grab at the, the loose rock. You can do that. And inside you will find the following. There's a little space where apparently some of the prisoners have hid a number of valuables. One of them is a note of deposit from a bank in Amberay. Now, this is worth four gold if redeemed in Amberay. You're not going to Amberay straight away, but if your characters ever make it to Amberay, this is worth four gold. There are a pair of silver cufflinks worth one gold, a sack of coins and gems, which is just two gold total. You can note that on your gold section, and a gold holy symbol of St. Hester, which is a sort of stylized sickle and wheat stalk And that is worth one gold as well. So decide how you're going to divide this up. So I look around inside of this hole, and I find the paper first, and I open it and read it. Oh, it appears to be a love letter. And I I take it, and I put it right into into my cloak. How Uh, dastardly. I have to. I have to. And then I'm... (laughs) I just knew because I was like, this is the only chance I'm ever going to get to out Ezio, Ezio. <laughs> <God damn. laughs> but it appears that the lover left a prize behind and I take out all of the gold that you've brought. We can split this evenly. Legitimately kind of mad. <laughs> <laughs> get work. <laughs> and I, as a humble person, will definitely take the smaller portion of the substantiated gold because I only need so much for my burdens. I'll take those cufflinks. Do you mind if I take this holy symbol? Uh, of course not. And uh, yeah, I grab the gold. <laughs> and so are you just like kind of passing this stuff up at this point, Saray? Are you still like kind of hanging on the rope a little bit? Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I like that. At a certain point, Saray, you will glance over to notice that there is an ill belcher <laughs> clinging to the underside <laughs> of the oubliette. Mere feet away from you. <laughs> its eyes yellow in the darkness. It's multiple rows of razor-sharp teeth, bared. It goes for the rope, scissors it immediately with its teeth, and you collapse down into the oubliette. Fuck. And then it Spider-Man drops on top of you. I believe I start combat by... Ah! 
<laughs> it's combat. Just for Saray, unless you all drop down into the hole behind her. I might make you do a round by yourself, Saray, just because. Fuck. Well, it was nice knowing you guys. I mean, you, you, how, are, how are you weak here? If there's any way other than you just got dropped. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like I, my body has seen enough of this freaking weary world. But I think also it's just dark down in an oubliette with the small light of the crack. I'm basically just going to be swinging at this giant monster with my club as best I can. It's a combat roll. Its endurance is eight. You get one die to get an eight. <laughs> uh, roll your weak point. <laughs> my weak point is a two. You got to go one round with it before the others can help you. Go ahead and roll combat one. A six. It's about as good as we can get for for failing. It is as good as you can get. Regrettably, it's not enough. Just give me the first little round here. Give me the first initial tussle. No one's hurt, but. It kind of hopped down on top of me. We try and elbow its orbital bone. Like I just send my elbow into, into its face and scrabble to my feet, grasping at my club, grabbing my club. Saray gets a little animalistic, right? I just scream at him. Like, ah! Ah! Trying to make myself scary, even, uh, and just swinging wildly at it. And I think my club catches its shoulder, but my club seems to sink in as this creature unhumanly moves forward and attempts to lash itself to my face and throat. Nice. Uh, Thessal and Ezio, do you intend to join the combat now? So I definitely yelled at Ezio to, to go help him, and I lower, because I... You know, I lost another 10 feet of rope, but I still got a little bit more. So I lower that back down and I tell Ezio to like climb down it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Because I was going to say, if you both just jump down there, you might have to take like a condition or something. But if one of you staying up, then Ezio can join the next round. No, no trouble at all. How are you vulnerable? Ezio really doesn't want to fight. Ezio is very, very unwilling to commit. And so that's pretty easy to take advantage of as he's slowly going down the rope. I don't like this, Thessel. I don't care what you like. Go! <laughs> All right, what's your weak point? It is also a two. Two is a bad number. So for this next round, you'll have three dice total, one for Ezio and then one for the second round. So go ahead and roll me a combat three. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Well, there was a two, got it, but yep. you got it. <laughs> so a two was rolled, so the result was five, three, and two. Five, three is enough to, to kill the monster, but the two is weak point. You'll both take a hit, unless you want to mark your armor. With all that in mind, let's begin the, the fiction here. Ezio, take it away. So uh, Ezio does the whole, I, you know, I, I don't like this. I don't care what you like. And he lands, like, on his feet and, like, slowly turns around just to see Saray hit the belcher in the shoulder with a stick. And it kind of reels back, and Ezio sees his opportunity and just lunges forward with the stiletto and gets it right above the tailbone and stabbing it lets out a shriek and turns around and, and bites at me and then rips off the shirt that i'm wearing oh great it rips off the chain shirt and saray is going to jump on its back grab it around at the bottom of the neck and just crack its neck the neck just breaks but i think it's not before it like bites at my forearm and rips off the whole arm of my robes with it so that my skin is just bared and scratching all along my forearm. Can we see your sneaky bits now? Yes. Wonderful. Nice. I love it. Somebody go ahead and roll eight gold dice. I don't know if I want you to do this. Nathan. Damn it. No, Nathan, I... why? Nathan, god damn it. <laughs> just, you're so bad. I've rolled one every <laughs> single time. Just let me push enter and it would be fine. No, it's my keyboard. <laughs> So you get to recover something from the monster. I'm going to pluck these eyes out. I'm tired of these things staring at me. Note that down. They're worth the gold when you get back to Fort Durin. Let's fast forward a little bit. You're out of the pit. You have solved this set. You can obviously keep looking around, or you can spend hunt roll tokens to find more treasure. But let's just have that scene where you're deciding what to do. Are you guys all right? Saray is trying to conceal the snaky aspects of her existence think uh we're coming up out of the dark and saray is tucking her arm into her as i described it before her like all weather coat so in her leathers like a kid who's cold out in the winter you just don't see anything it's like she's lost an arm Ezio, did you get a glance of glittering black snake eyes <laughs> when you were down there oh yeah that's 
What's wrong with your body? Nothing. Nothing's wrong. I thought I saw eyes. You thought wrong. You thought differently. She's trying to, like, walk away from you in a general not-you direction. Hey, 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 hey! And I, I grab you by the shoulder and pull back on you, revealing a bunch of snake heads. Probably some snakes even fall down, right, onto the ground. Oh my god, that's horrible. Ah! What? Ah! Why are you keeping snakes? This isn't what you think it is! I begin trying to cover myself back up as the snakes crawl up and down my naked arm. I don't... I don't know! Patting at my neck where they reformed a semblance of that same armored carapace that they had before. Thessal, I think you'll notice that Saray's not even aware of it, but part of her throat balloons a little bit. Like there's something underneath the skin or in the throat. And Saray doesn't even seem to notice it. Saray, I I think you may be sick. How how do you mean? Ah. In the distance, whispered voices. She's the best one. Uh, Who hears that? Ever? All of us? No one. That was just for the audience. Oh! (laughs) Great, yeah. (laughs) Just for you, audience. I might be able to help you if I can find the right ingredients. Something is very wrong. Touch your neck. I touch my neck. I guess I feel like an undercurrent of what appears to be a, a snake moving within my own body, under the skin. Oh. Yes. I told you this place was sick, and it has made me sick as well. I f- fear you may be right. <sighs> Let's keep going. The faster we get out of here, the better off we'll be. And I look back at the mill. Let's make our way back to the road from here and start heading back up. I don't think there's any further reason for us to stay. You said you could heal me with the right ingredients. Do you even know, or are you just saying that? I I don't know, but I'm sure we can find something that will help you. Don't speak to me like I'm the near dead. I'm... Uh, maybe the hunter knows? He is probably already dead. Come on. Maybe there's something at his camp, though, if we go back through it again. And I think with that, it sounds like Thessal at least is stalking off toward the road. Again, everything's fairly close to each other here. It doesn't take you long to get back to more or less where you were before you cut across the other way to get to the farmhouse. The first thing you'll run into, in fact, is the shrine. There is a small shrine just a little bit off the road. The exterior of the shrine, now it's very small. And when I say small, imagine like those sheds that they sell outside of a Home Depot. It's it's like that. It's that, it's that small, very little tiny, tiny building. It's decorated with little like stone plaques that are carved with symbols sacred to saint hester the cornucopia the sickle sheaths of wheat gourds that kind of thing and there's just a very simple wooden door that goes inside saray is definitely interested in this a because i wish to build a monument to my god and also i'm cursed i want to go try and pray inside of this uh holy place since it sounds like Thessal was leading the way back up the road, I feel like I pass it and Ezio passes it, and then you would call out to us that you want to stop, right? Yeah, totally. W- wait, wait a moment. What? And turn back. I think I just go inside, right? Like That's exactly what happens. The what is not answered. I would like to pray. E- examine this as well, I think, you know, but... Go ahead and give me a hunt roll now just to see, so we can kind of gauge what kind of information we're getting here. Are you doing anything special or are you just looking around? At a glance, it's a few very small little prayer plinths um, set before a statue of St. Hester. That's wonderful. I've had this unknown scroll for a (laughs) while now, and I think almost without thinking, I don't have, you know, a text to read from i think that this almost automatically comes out and sets itself out in front of me as if by providence or something oh absolutely and i would like to read from this scroll and recite a prayer what is the scroll what's on it it is hymns it is songs a collection of songs of growth we've been kind of in a autumnal and a reaping space These are songs of the planting, of the opposite of where we (laughs) are now, right? They're hymns about sowing seeds and helping young plants to grow their deep roots and find their way forward. Metaphors of children and their passages through their life. 
roots implies below the ground. That's very interesting to me. Roll roll a two die hunt roll. Let's see how it goes. I can. Uh, two sixes. Nice. Very good. There it is. <laughs> Take a hunt roll token. Let me tell you a little bit about the scene now as you're sort of there. The statue of St. Hester looks really similar to the statue of Lord Galdron that was near the ruins of the keep, except this is the proper statue. Her arms are crossed. She's depicted as a, a husky woman with bountiful robes and, and a dress, you know, very full. And in one hand, she holds a sickle. And in the other hand, she holds a cornucopia. And she has a very, like, kind of beneficent expression on her face. And there's an offering bowl at the feet of the statue. And like I said, there are these little prayer plants. And you are singing this song of growing strong roots. And St. Hester, or her spirit, or something, touches you, reaches out to you, and conveys the idea that the roots of this place, meaning the shrine, are fouled and dying. You get a strong sense of something bad down below. What are the other two of you doing in the meantime? But at least I would have kind of followed Saray and probably not gone into the shrine, but I would linger in the doorway. And as someone who is a failed farmer who wishes he, you know, knew how to grow, I'm, I just listened to Saray singing about sowing, about growth, about flourishing. It's beautiful and it, it hits at a point, you know, that I feel sick and have felt sick, right? Like I have been cursed with this withering touch. I try to take peace in her song. And I, you know, I would like to canonize that Saray has a beautiful singing voice. Ezio is not so at ease. Ezio is staring in the direction of the mill, sweating profusely, dousing himself in perfume. The hunter has not defeated the demon yet because it's still there. <laughs> Ezio is stroking the carved handle of his, of his stiletto, worrying it. A path along the hilt, obviously tarnished now. I start walking toward the mill. Hmm. At the conclusion of this little communion, then, Saray, what do you do with this information that you have? Remind me of the set goal. To learn the secret history of Hester's Mill. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. I would like to light these holy hymnal scriptures on fire and leave the flames going inside of this sanctuary. I'm going to I'm going to try and burn the fields to that's what you do when the field goes fallow, you can uh you burn the field down. I would like to lighting this place ablaze. The meaning the shrine. Yeah. Like leave it leaving a flame to consume the shrine to try and uh purify it. I like that. And I don't think there's anything at risk necessarily, so I'll just let you do it. I like how you've described it. You got Oh wait, did you get your third hot roll token or yeah, I have three. Oh, heck yeah. I'm down to spend that for this. That seems like the the pay yeah. the payoff to this, right? Am I I love it. Yeah. I'll spend all three of my hunt roll tokens and learn the secret. Learning the secret will require standing there watching it burn for a moment. It goes up pretty quickly. The statue of Saint Hester falls over to reveal what is essentially a, a trapdoor, but it's open, so it's like just a space with a ladder going down. And you have a very, very foul feeling coming from that space beneath the shrine. If you go down below, you will find a space similar in size, a little bigger perhaps, beneath the shrine. And the walls are painted with a mural that wrap around, that tell the story of the village. But also down here, there is a second shrine. A small gold statue of a crow wearing a crown. And all around it are half-burnt candles and markings and things like that, right? To learn the story, you have to take the time to follow the drawings and, and learn everything there is to learn. By the time you finish that, Ezio will be at the mill and doing things. So do you, do you want to pick up with you, Ezio, for a bit? That sounds wonderful. The string music has reached another pitch. The question is, Thessal, where are you going to be? Are you following Ezio or are you <laughs> with Saray? No, I would have stayed because I, I was watching Saray sing and I was like a little hypnotized by it. So Ezio wandered off during that time. And then I would have been, what are you doing? 
as Saray starts burning this shrine down. And then I think we, I would have stood there with Saray and watched it burn down. And then, of course, then also been curious and would have followed Saray down into this secret shrine below. You'll see the same thing. You'll see the mural, that little gold statue. And it's small enough to be carried, by the way. I was going to take it. Yeah. <laughs> you can take it. <laughs> Taking the statue confers the following condition, servant of Malfast. Oh, shoot. Sorry, guys. I was just trying to be greedy. <laughs> <laughs> what a role reversal we're about to have. <laughs> when you put your hands on the statue and take it, how do you know something has changed? How have your feelings changed about the demon atop the mill? I've been seeking to take Cyrus's place on the Earthen Council, right? That's my goal. I have a bitterness to me about the fact that I couldn't grow plants before. And I think seeing the, the wilds here and the flourishing growth here, what shifts in me is I have been trying to constrain growth, control it. And instead, if I give into the wildness, the wilderness, the chaos of nature, I will always have enough. Ooh, also, 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 a visual aspect to this is that there are roots growing out of the bottom of the statue where it's placed because the roots are fallow or whatever. Roots coming out and bulging between the brick laid work. That's our fallow root structure in the basement. So it just feels very like unbounded. And so I think it's realizing that there is a, I think, a, a heresy in trying to civilize what need not be civilized. Interesting. Ezio, you all have had kind of the day of it. It's going to be dusk fairly soon, but we're not quite there yet. Where do you go specifically as you approach the mill? Ezio approaches the mill. I imagine the sun sitting on the shoulders of Malfast. As I come upon this mill, Ezio's drenched in sweat by this point, worrying the spot in his stiletto. And I, I reach into my pack and put the stiletto back and pull out the bandolier, and I begin walking toward the mill. Are the doors open now they are open and you will hear from inside the hunter say curse that woman Ugh. uh hello he sort of sticks his head out and oh it's you have you come to return my property my friend is sick can you help her i am not a medic i'm not a physiker i don't this place has made her sick we must cleanse it of its rot that's what i'm here to do yeah, come inside. Perhaps you can help me. Ezio looks behind him sheepishly and, and begins walking in. The mill's like a two-story stone building, except only one story is used. The, up, the upper level is just storage. The large double doors lead inside. As I told you, they're painted sort of deep purple and green. And there was, of course, this message on the outside of the doors that said, Do not believe Mandrake's lies. Inside the mill is a rather horrifying scene. The walls and floor are stained red with old blood. Bits of cracked bone are scattered all over the place. Burnt candles are nestled here and there, and in the center of the room is the massive millstone. And the millstone has been delicately etched all over with hundreds and hundreds of profane symbols. And the bedstone that the millstone sits in is stained a very, very deep red and has a thick film of dried caked blood inside the trench. I can't make sense of any of these words on the millstone. I'm sure it's some sort of message, although having read the message on the door, I'm not sure who to believe, what to believe. I fear that we may have to just meet this creature in combat, you and I. Um, us? Yes, you have a weapon, don't you? Ezio's hand has not left his bag. <laughs> yeah, yes, um... You look like a strong, capable-ish person. I am. Good. Well, then, I suppose we should stay here and make a plan. The creature seems to be in some sort of stasis, some sort of strange, I don't know, trance, say. It just repeats over and over again the horrific scene of one of my men, the soldiers, one of the soldiers being torn apart. Are you Lord Galdrin? And he smiles, a knowing smile. Yes, I was once called that, though I have not been called that for many, many years. 
I will tell you that this doesn't make any sense. He looks like he's about in his 50s, and this was 100 years ago. This supposedly happened. <laughs> I'd say I was extremely confused and looking panicked between this Galdrin and the Millstone. Can I make sense of any of these? Please make a hunt roll, yeah. I don't believe I have anything to give me any sort of... What about my autograph from Beatrix? Would that give me some sort of an advantage? Oh, like maybe there's some more symbols or puzzles inside of it, maybe. I don't know. Or perhaps it's even enchanted. You could definitely use it as a justification for the second die if you want. I would like to. Yeah, that seems right. I said double ones in my head, and I, I can't believe it actually <laughs> happened. Yes. No way! Yeah, d- double sixes to double ones, baby. Yeah, that's, that's snake eyes. You lose all of your... I lose all of my hunt tokens. I have zero... I, I now have zero oh. hunt tokens. And you encounter something terrible. As you're taking a look around, he says, Oh, uh, how, how low was the sun when you came in? Uh, behind the... Behind Malfast, I looked like a... Is the sun getting ready to set? Yes. Uh, quick, quick, tie me up. You're very good at that, after all. I didn't tie you up. Tie me up! Ezio digging in his bag. Um, don't, okay. Where? Just, just hurry, you fool, hurry, tie me up now! I will cash in one of my slots for rope and do my best to tie him up. He is growing in size. Oh, I don't like that. His arms are starting to be covered by a thick pelt of fur. His neck and torso are twisting and bulging. His teeth are sort of leaping out of his face as they elongate and stretch. We'll come back to that. Back at the mural, let me tell you the story. The rough contours of the known history are correct. As it was described, there was an uprising and that sort of thing, right? But according to the mural, it leaves out some really important details. For a start, Lord Galdron was more than a mere heretic. He was, in fact, a brutal tyrant who had no love for the people of his newly conquered lands. And he inflicted a regime of violence and forced labor on them. The people of Hester's Mill, dedicated as they were to their saint, were given special attention by this cruel, heretical lord. Another detail, according to the mural, is that the people of Hester's Mill were unable to fight back against him by normal means, and so they became so desperate to free themselves from his yoke that they sought the help of a woman who you know to be the famous showwoman and diabolist Beatrix Mandrake. This woman used her talents to contact a greater demon. This greater demon showed her how to create an army that could fight back against Galdron's soldiers. The pictures then depict the people of Hester's mill grabbing Galdron's soldiers and sacrificing them under the millstone. And then the pictures depict them drinking the slurry of blood and bone produced from crushing the men underneath the millstone. And then the pictures depict the people of Hester's Mill, man and woman alike, giving birth to the cropopod creatures, as you're calling them. And these creatures and the great demon are what attacked Lord Galdron's keep and overthrew him. But the story continues, because over time, the demon wanted more. And so the people of Hester's Mill began turning on each other and sacrificing each other beneath the millstone. And then there is a blank. But you will know, because the storytelling style is one that is very familiar to you in your studies, you will be able to deduce that the only way to be rid of this demon is to complete the task. All of Lord Galdron's men and Lord Galdron himself must be sacrificed beneath the millstone. And it's not in the mural, but at some point, Beatrix Mandrick must have realized the evil she brought upon the place and tried to do her best to contain it, right? But, you know. Do you see what me must do to cleanse this place truly of its wicked ways? Tessel looks over at you. Yes, I do. It is very clear. Where is Ezio? What a good cut. Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) Ezio, Lord Galdron, is rapidly transforming into a monstrous beast. You are going to try to tie him up, yes? Or are you running? (laughs) No, I'm going to try to tie him up. This isn't the time to run. I think running seems like the worst idea, even to a coward. What could go wrong? 
Zach or JD. I'll, I'll go with the easy one. You have to fight this version of Lord Cauldron. Yeah. You tie him up, but it is to a foundational structure within the mill, and the mill will definitely collapse in. It's pretty good. JD, any suggestions? Perhaps some children of Malfast, some of these cropopods, show up. That would be bad. Uh, good. So take one light color die if the task is something you're skilled at because of your occupation, background, or training, or because you're taking advantage of a piece of equipment or the environment. I'm an escaped prisoner. I would say I know how knots are tied. You're also using the rope, right? Does that already count? Yeah, or the equipment as well. We got it a few ways. Second light die is for accepting a devil's bargain. My devil's bargain is probably the most punitive one that will be called out, but it'll be on your companions to come up with something better. The devil's bargain is you will tie him up, but you will have to contend with a tentacle of Malfast. Okay. Uh, Devil's bargain would be one of the snakes that sloughed off of Saray had made its way into your bag and will emerge and and slither within you. Oh, no. (laughs) Hadn't someone else taken a snake inside them anyway, besides Saray? Me. I'm the only one yet unsnaked. (laughs) (laughs) The millstone is covered in blood. You will have to contend with the speaking voices of the thousands of dead that are plastered (laughs) upon the millstone. I'm going to accept the snake crawling into my bag. No! I, okay. Oh, come on. This has been the theme. Is yeah, that the, no, I don't it, know what the snake is. It mean. is, and that's why me as a viewer <laughs> and also a participant is like, get away! Get away! Uh, I think you're taking a light die automatically because you are risking your mind or body. Uh, you get two light dice and one dark. Uh, bear in mind, if you roll six on the dark, character is done. That's five dark. Woo! Okay. It's not higher than Woo! your current dark, so you are good. <laughs> And you'll succeed, but there's going to be a complication. The complication is you are going to be trapped in the mill. Oh. If you (laughs) want to add a dark die to try to get a six, you can roll them all again and try to go for a six. You can't do this to me, Jason. I'm obviously a gambler. I, we're, no, we're going to have to sit there. We're going to have to sit there. I'm going to get stuck in the mill. Also, it's, it, I like the image of them having to come and find me. It's great. I'm, I'm going to be stuck in the mill. I'm going to be stuck in the mill. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead and just give me the first part. Describe tying up the rapidly becoming monstrous <laughs> Lord Cauldron. <laughs> he begins, well, turning into a werewolf, and Ezio begins panicking and pulling the rope out. Ezio shoves the rope into his mouth and pushes him back over into one of the supporting beams of the mill and runs around him and begins tying him to the post. And I tie him with the best knot that Ezio definitely knows, but Nathan never went to Boy Scouts. But I tie him fast there, and his legs begin kicking, and they and his knees buckle backwards, right, and reverse, and then tie his feet quickly to the, the supporting beam. And then I turn around to get out of the mill, and the, and the door is shut. Uh, no, that's not how you're sealed. You are sealed in because Malfast begins sliding off the roof of the mill, and it's just a curtain of thick, oily black tentacles covering the doorway. If you stay very quiet, it might not become aware of you. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. So Ezio turns around, oh, clasps his hands over his mouth, and turns back. Again, Ezio's just drenched, just dripping sweat. It looks like he took a swim, and, and turns back to the werewolf who's bucking at his bonds. And Ezio looks back at the door and cower behind the millstone and wait. Saray and Thessal, for the first time in a good long while, you don't see the demon atop the mill. And you now know the way to be rid of it. And you know the history of this place. What do you do? Has he done it then? Do you think? No, I don't. You must help him. Go. I need to go back to the farmhouse. There's something that I think might help us there. What do you go? And I start running off towards the house. I begin begin hobbling my way towards the center of town. Indeed, indeed. What's your plan, Thessal? Servant of Malfast. I'm going to go chop down that scarecrow. Nice, good. <laughs> gotta gotta wake this boy up. I love it. The distance is about the same, like running to the farmhouse and then Saray running to the village. In fact, you'll get there faster, Thessal, because Saray is still has a sort of ambient pain from her previous injury. Saray, you see the bulk of the demon has sort of slid off the roof, but it's still 
doing its pantomime. It's still regurgitating the soldier, but its body is covering the entrance to the mill. What do you do? It is not dead. And Ezio must be inside of the mill. I will have to find another way in. And just about that time, Thessal, what do you do to the scarecrow? I'm going to take my scythe and chop it right in half. I'm going to harvest that scarecrow. At that moment, Saray, the greater demon, and all the little crow babies inside the nest of black tentacles, they all stop and they in unison turn their heads to look at you. And then a shimmering, purplish, glowing tear in time and space begins to open up in front of you. The demon is still a good couple hundred paces away, no immediate threat, except this tear in the fabric of of space begins to open up, and you see on the other side oily black tentacles getting ready to reach out of that space at you. What do you do? I've wanted to do this for a minute. I drop to one knee and extend my arms out to my sides, and I call the fucking swarm to me, the host of rats and all kinds of things that drag their bellies across the disgusting floor of this forest to just eat away at whatever is in front of me. I would like to use my ritual. I love it. I think that's wonderful. I'm very into it. You've already said what you hope will happen. What could go wrong here? (laughs) Nathan and and JD. I'll start. It fails, and the tentacles reach out of the portal and rend you to pieces. It succeeds, but your control of the rats is tenuous, and the rats rip you to pieces. (laughs) Also also great. Uh, It succeeds, but the swarm you summon is the Lord of Snakes who still has not shown its face. Oh. (laughs) We love the Lord of Snakes. (laughs) Love all that. Okay, take a look at your dice. You get a light die if you're using a skill or equipment or the environment in some way. So I have protection, speed, and protection. Protection. Yeah, Yeah, that was kind of what I was thinking. Devil's bargains. I like the devil's bargain of it's the snake thing that shows up. I second that. I, 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 I have no... The the snakes show instead of the rats, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I th- yeah, that feels like the right. Yeah, it's still a swarm. It's still vermin. But <laughs> JD, you can add whatever you want. But I think no, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm yeah, obviously, I'm gonna, I like the idea originally. The, yeah. So if you're just gonna like accept that, no matter what, I yeah. love it. Yeah, and take a dark die because you're definitely you're definitely risking your mind or body. Oh, you have to because of the ritual anyway. So let's see what happens. Please don't die. Ah. <laughs> Was it six dark? Yeah, it's six dark. Sray, this is it. Give us a fabulous end. What does it look like? I am trying to call the vermin to me. You feel the heat at the tips of your fingers trying to call the world to your aid. And when they don't come, it feels cool and slick and slithering. Because what comes to my aid truly are the snakes. And they feast upon this thing that comes out of the rift in the world. And just when the heroic score might start, Saray begins coughing and coughing until she becomes the overly used skin for something greater than herself. Good, yeah. That's this snake comes out of her mouth right you see her teeth and then you see the fangs beneath and below her teeth that pop out of her mouth as this giant god demigod other monster comes out from her and leaves nothing left behind except a used up skin can you append to that the original snake coming over and grabbing the hand of the second humanoid mass of snakes and like lifting it out oh i kind i do kind of like being the bride i've never nice. been like Good. in my past life and that may be why the being from the alternate fused dimension 
game recognizes when it's outplayed <laughs> as the bride to be and the originary lord fuse themselves together they entwine their tails together i love that to be clear the the original snake lord is a is a mound of snakes right what what are you are you like a single big snake or something or yes i am i am the bride to be as it were right like the queen in chess is more powerful than the king yeah we'll just we'll just leave it right there i don't know if we have to go any further on that no that's beautiful i want to cut over to thessal actually thessal you hack the scarecrow in two split it apart it falls down off the post or bits of it are just hanging there right and you hear the and you see the little child heart on the ground beating what do you do i'm gonna crush it i just take it in my hand and squeeze it you take it in your hand and the little boy appears and he steps up to you and puts his hands out as if he wants you to put it in his hands what do you do yeah i feel like at this point i'm i've done a full heel turn so i'm gonna crush this heart i look this child dead in the eyes and squeeze his eyes widen his mouth drops open and he goes white as a sheet a single tear rolls down his ghostly cheek and then he fades away if i understand this right and let me know if i'm incorrect the way to get rid of malfast right is to grind lord galdrin under the millstone that is correct yes so if lord galdrin dies otherwise that won't get rid of malfast is that correct no you have to deal with malfast in the traditional manner (laughs) perfect i start putting together a scarecrow oh nice good you just go back down to the basement and start assembling one i already kept all of the the parts for it so i just start assembling it right there in the field right next to this dead scarecrow that i just slayed nice i like it i assume you're going to name lord galdron correct good that feels like a good cut and I think in that case, we'll just go to an epilogue with Ezio. How long do you wait around just being stuck in the mill? After tying Lord Cauldron up, Ezio, Ezio hand, hides behind the mill and, like, clutches his stiletto to his chest and basically cries. Ezio doesn't move. Nearly until sunup, Lord Cauldron has been pressing at his bonds, gnashing. He's spit the rope out from his mouth and is gnarling threats toward Ezio, who can do nothing but sit and whimper and hope that he does not break his bonds. It is only a sunup when he returns to his human form. Can I pick that up there? Because there's a bit of an echo here from earlier. Because the way he returns to his normal form is by being born from the husk of this sort of massive lupine creature, much like Beatrix was from the bear. He tears out of the flesh of this massive fanged furred beast he just tears out he's covered in blood and gore and importantly he doesn't know who you are he doesn't know where he is he just says i have to cleanse the land i have to go back to camp i've found the creature i have to cleanse the land the scarecrow has crept into the the mill and lord galdron emerges newborn asks me who i am and how to get out And the scarecrow bursts up and begins strangling him. And and it's in shadow, right, as you see the scarecrow over Lord Galdron and and Ezio frightened back against the wall. Cinematically, I'm thinking of the scene in Alien where the android tries to shove the magazine down Ripley's throat. You know what I mean? It's not strangling it. It's shoving its, like, strawed arm down his throat to strangle him that way. Ezio is, like, creeping around the wall and looks up and sees the second level and runs to a, a ladder. Oh, you just leap, huh? Straight to the ground. <laughs> Absolutely. Nice. Good, good. Do the two of you meet up again? Or is this the end of your story together? Yeah, I think I am taking Dominion. In the name of Malfast, whose golden statue I will sit, not hidden, underneath an old shrine. But I will place it in the center of our square. And I begin constructing a new shrine out in the open saying, yes, like, this is the bounty of Malfast. This is Malfast's mill. And I will live off the land and let it grow and overtake all of these old buildings. So, yeah, I don't think we'll meet up. I think you're on your own. Eventually, the power of Beatrix's spell that allows you to see Malfast will go away. You know it's there, but 
new people will not.